great to been uh, it's been great to have Brother Cleghorn and his wife and Levi. Um, looking forward to what God has for us tonight. And uh, brother, why don't you and your, your you and your wife both singing, or just you? Yeah, let's, yeah, sure. Uh, they're going to sing a special for us. Uh, feel free to uh, use wireless mics if you need, and uh, then you can go right on ahead. My heart's been blessed through the testimony tonight. Thank you for that. That was uh, very, uh, it's along the lines of some things I'm going to talk about during tonight's message. This song isn't particularly about the message at all, but what I have to do is I have to try to establish a new precedent. Because I hear that what we're remembered for here a lot is a fast food song that we wrote on deputation and sang a while back. And so, uh, <laughs> so we got to we got to establish a new precedent about that. Anyways, I hope that this song blesses you. It's a um, blessing to me. I was working in town one afternoon, attending some business affairs. When I heard a commotion a couple of streets over, I wondered what was happening there. A young man was running from in that direction and stopped just to catch his breath. I asked him to please tell me what was the hurry. He smiled up to me and he said, I was trying to catch the crippled man. Did he run past this way? He was rushing home to tell everyone what Jesus did today. And the mute man was telling myself and the deaf girl he's leaving to answer God's call. It's hard to believe, but if you don't trust me, ask the blind man, he saw it all. Ask the blind man, he saw it all. My friend, if the burdens and troubles you carry are heavy and dragging you down, and you've tried everything you can possibly think of, and there's no relief to be found, well, that very same Jesus that altered the future of the blind man, the deaf, and the lame is still reaching out in your hour of trouble. One touch and you're never the same. You'll be trying to catch the crippled man. Did he run past this way? He was rushing home to tell everyone what Jesus did today. And the mute man was telling myself and the deaf girl he's leaving to answer God's call. It's hard to believe, but if you don't trust me, ask the blind man, he saw it all. Ask the blind man, he saw it all. It's hard to believe, but if you don't trust me, Ask the blind man, he saw it all. Ask the blind man, he saw it all. Well, again, the Lord has blessed my heart through you guys today. And um, just fellowshipping with Brother Reed and his family at lunch. That was a huge blessing as well. Thank you for that, brother. I love your guys' family. Um, I do have a huge answer to prayer that I want to let you guys know about. For anybody who loves missions, and this is, I love Mission Sunday, right? Um, brother Ron Moreland gave me a sneak preview after he took the bandages off of, he, of his face, and I'm telling you, it is a lot better. <laughs> and don't say that, because he doesn't want to hear it, that it wouldn't have taken much to get there. <laughs> Now, if, if there's a guy next Sunday that comes through the back door looking a little bit like Sean Connery or whatever, though, just make sure you stick your leg out and trip him because it's him. <laughs> no, seriously, though, he did send me a picture of Sean Connery saying this is me after I took the bandages off. <laughs> you know I had to do that, Brother Ron. <laughs> well, um, let's, let's, uh, let's not waste time. Let's get right down to God's word. Brother, Brother Ron did tell me, though, that this, morning, this morning's message was a little bit dusty. 
And so, <laughs> we'll try to do something different tonight. For those of you who weren't here Sunday um, morning, this morning we talked about how we are dust and how God still uses us. So that's what we're referring to there for anybody who wasn't here. Um, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Is this microphone okay? This, do I have this on? Okay, good. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I want to read a few verses here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 5 to start with. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. It says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And verse 5 is the key verse. It says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again that we can meet together tonight and worship you. Please bless the service. Bless each one who hears. In your name we pray. Amen. This verse to me has is, is always been dear to my heart as a missions verse because the first missions trip I ever went on as a kid, um, the man who was directing the, the, the youth missions trip there chose this verse as our key verse. We memorized it both in English and in the language of the place that we were at on, on our missions trip. And it's been, it's been um, so key to me ever since. And I love how it says, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Because that's what missions is about. Not preaching ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. And I was talking um, with some of the men from the church and, uh, and with Brother Ron earlier and um, just hearing about um, all of the servants of the Lord. All, it says, ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. You guys have a lot of servants here. I uh, hear that there's at least five families, basically, um, are either sent out of here or from here, whatever, that are, that are in missions. Let's, what I, what I want to do is try to um, take some time to recognize, to talk about some of these things, so that, and relate it to you guys. I want us to look at it together and see what God is doing and that'll tie in with the title of my message, which I'll tell you in a minute. But if I can, I'd like this, this message tonight to be a little bit different. And you say a little bit different, like, like different like what? I don't want it to be weird, but I want it to be a little bit more informal. And we can do that because pastor's not here, and brother Ron's not here, and when the cat's away, the mice will play. They're going to regret having ever turned us loose and said, do whatever, amen? <laughs> no, seriously though, seriously though, I don't know any other church this size that can say that has as many things going on in different areas of missions more than you guys do. I'm serious about that. I was act I've been amazed just asking about it, looking into it. So you've got, you know, right away I think of the Moreland family because that's the one that's probably the biggest on all of our minds right now with their imminent departure to the mission field. All right. So we've got the Moreland, you've got the Moreland family and what an awesome family that they are. Amen. The Lord has blessed them with just, look at these guys right back here. Nathan, Caleb, Grace. The Lord has really blessed their family. And he's going to use them in a mighty way, guys. He's going to use them in ways that we can't even imagine. He's promised that. So you've got the Moreland family. You've got Brother Xavier and his family. And he's going to be in, in what, June? In June in Siberia, right? And... Um, We've got other families. Um, there's the Yoder family, right? And you, know, you guys know what they do. And you've got, um, I think there's several other families, either from here or basically, help me out. You guys help me think about it a little bit. I, wanted, I want us to like toss information back and forth here rather than just listening. The Jarvis family, that's right. Yeah, that's another name that I forgot, the Jarvis family. The Gallahans. Oh, and you've also got, um, and they not, may not be officially sent from here, but you've got um, John and Emily, right? And, and their family too, right? Okay, so those are just families that are based out of here who, who are missionaries. And look at this. That's a lot. That's a lot. Let's take some time to recognize that. But you've also got a pastor who is heavily involved in missions because, for instance, where is he today? Amen? Praise God for that. He's on the mission field today. He's over there with Brother Fielder and the others preaching and teaching, teaching Indian pastors because, guys, 
what he's doing over there, I talked about this morning a little bit, but it is fantastic. You, wouldn't, you can't imagine the need for these Indian pastors to hear what your pastor and the other pastors who are there are going to teach them. Because a lot of these young men, I know them. They are not, they're, they're not, they're not experienced, educated, grounded pastors, some of them. Some of them are just, are just people who are, who are like, there's no church in my village. I've got to do something. And they're struggling, like, what do I do? You know, how do I teach? How do, how do I do this and this? And how do I handle these problems? And what your pastor is doing over there is just absolutely, you know, you, you, you can't say enough of how important that, that it is. So you've got all these things going on. And you've got not only that, but you've got um, efforts that you do in, in the lives of, of, other, of other ministries. You know, we talked about this morning, you've got the jail ministry. You've got the children's ministries that you do with the, with the spring carnival and all these things. Um, and you've got parts in our lives, in mine and Kara's life and Levi's life, and all the other missionaries that you support. And tonight, what we did was we looked at the video here, and you saw a little bit of the beginnings of some fruit that's starting to sprout in China. But think about the other fruit. What fruit do we know of that has come about because of the lives of the missionaries from here and because of the efforts of, your, of the church's um, missions efforts? I want you to just think about it for a second. Can you think of people who have been born again because of it? Can you think of people who have been born again in other countries because of it? Can you think of people who have an opportunity to read God's word who didn't before because of it? How about the, the Bible project in India where, um, the, where they're trying to, um, Brother Ron was explaining it to me and I forget all the details, but um, there's some huge opportunities there with the Bibles that they're giving out and the Bibles that may be translated also in India. And then with what Brother Ron and his family would be working on in Armenia. So if we think about all this, we have a lot to rejoice about. And you guys have a lot to rejoice about as a church. I'm from a small church. I grew up in a church um, somewhat smaller than this one, but in a, in a kind of a rural area in Indiana. And I just wish that we had had one missionary sent from our congregation during the time I was growing up. That's what I wish. Just one. So you guys have a lot to rejoice about. But still, here's what I kind of want to do tonight. Um, I want to tell you some things about what life will be like for the people that you know, your family that you love. The Moreland family, the Xavier, Brother Xavier and his family when they, um, when they arrive on the mission field, and the others. I want to talk a little bit about this because we've just, it's a good time. We've just seen a little bit tonight on the video of how life was for us in a practical sense when we arrived on the mission field. Now, this is about to happen in the lives of your loved ones. They are your loved ones, amen? They're your family, amen? amen. Things like this are about to happen in their lives. And so I want to preach a little bit and talk a little bit and share a few things story-wise about this and kind of tell you some things that they would tell you over the next year or two years if they could. And some of the things that they would, that they would want to say they won't be able to when the time comes. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you how things can happen now so that you know a little bit more how to love them, how to pray for them, how to be involved in their lives, and how to rejoice in what God is doing through them. So like, I'm thinking of the Moreland family in particular right now, and I'm talking about this, and I'm thinking about how I just wish Brother Ron was here tonight. Brother Ron, we wish you were here, man. Um, but we're, I'm thinking about what life is going to be like when they, when they get on the plane and there's a lot of emotions that, Brother Xavier, there's a load of emotions and stuff that's going to, that come in when you're like, okay, I am literally moving my family to a, another country around the world right now, you know? And we're not talking about it. We're not planning on it. We're doing it today. Every step we take is toward the plane. You know, when that day rolls around, that is a big day. That's a big day. And there's nothing better than to have a church family that's with you on that day, you know? And the day, two days after that, one day or two days after that, when they step off the airplane and they realize, I am literally in a foreign country to live, you know, that's a big day too. But unfortunately, most of you won't be able to be there <laughs> personally, but you can through prayers and through support and through um, we, we have a lot of instant messaging or whatever these days that people, you know, it's, it, it helps. It helps. It's good. It's a good tool. 
So, you know, when I first arrived in China, as with, when I moved our family there, there's one thing that kind of sums up the experience. I was, um, you know, there's a lot of new things, and I don't want to go down through the list and talk about all the new things individually, because that would just waste time, and you guys have heard a lot of that before from different men. But something that sums it up was I was standing there, and outside of our neighborhood, when we finally got moved in, I was standing there, and there was all these people, just masses of people going back and forth, and I saw this one girl walking along that had this long coat on, and they like to wear things in China that have English writing on them. And nobody knows what it says. And most of the time, it makes no sense at all. It's just letters arranged, you know, and uh, it's not even words. But sometimes it is words, and it's just hilarious, okay? So this girl's walking along, you know, and she's got this long coat, and on the back of it, in huge white letters, it says, I'm the first beagle on the moon. <laughs> And I started to laugh, and then I'm like, I wanted to get my phone and take a picture of it, but I thought that would be weird. Um, and so I didn't, but then I started thinking, I'm like, you know, that's me. <laughs> I feel like the first beagle on the moon. If you can imagine how out of place that would look, it's about right. All right? Now, all this effort that goes into missions, you know, this is the moment that it all starts to come together, right? You're on the foreign field, and you're there, and so... Brother Xavier, you're, you're going to be like this. You're like, okay, now I'm on the mission field. All this has come together. I'm ready to do missions. But that's not what's going to happen. You know, you're not ready to do missions because you can't talk to anybody. You know, and you can't, you don't know anybody. And, and, and most of your life is wrapped up, completely wrapped up in just staying alive. Okay, so when we, uh, you know, it's not like anybody was trying to kill us. But, so don't get the wrong sentence. <laughs> But when we were there, you know, um, we couldn't move into a house for a while. And so pretty much every day we went out on the street and tried to find something to eat. All day, every day, pretty much. You know, because by the time it took hours to walk here and there and find something that Karen and Levi could have with dietary restrictions, you know, kind of tough. Um, Why well, then it was time to do it again for lunch. <laughs> so we're just going around and trip to the police station, talk to them, and then go back out and try to find something to eat. We did that for a couple months, man. You know, um, we tried to cook in the hotel room, like you saw the picture of the crock pot. One time, and then we got in trouble. They're like, we're going to kick you out of here if you try that again. <laughs> Why? Um, but, you know, um, you know then the, the daily necessities of living in a foreign country kind of compound in some weird ways. You know? And the reason I'm going to describe this to you is not to make it sound depressing at all, or not to, and also not to make it sound like, oh, wow, your, your missionaries just go through stuff you can't imagine. I don't want it to sound like that. But I'm building to a point that says, Basically, with all of our missions effort, with the money that we're putting into it, with the lives and friends that we're putting into it, with the effort that's culminating into what we call missions, what is all this stuff doing? That's what we're going to build towards right there. So basically, you're going to you spend a, a whole day, you know, and you just successfully maybe got toothpaste and toilet paper, all right? And, the, and you worked hard all day. You know, the language isn't easy. At first, I remember asking for, um, uh, you know, going to the haircut place and saying, um, you know, can you make my hair a little bit longer? And I didn't know I had said that till later. You know, but they're trying to figure out what to do with my hair, you know, so it just takes hours, you know, and you explain stuff forever. And then when you go to the grocery store, we would go to the grocery store and not know exactly what to say. And so we would just do our best and say something and then watch what they gave us and make a note <laughs> and be like, that's what happens, <laughs> basically. I would do that like all day long out on the street in different places and just say stuff and be like, oh, that's what happens when I do that. <laughs> it's not optimal. It's not the best way to learn. Um, it, it's, a, you know, it, it's, a, it's good, though. It, um, in, in the Taji boy's language, I was surveying different places, and you know, I, I put my arm around this one guy in Tajikistan, and I told him in my very best, I was like, you're my best friend. So he pulls out a cigarette and hands it to me, and I'm like... I'm like, he's like, this is what you asked for. He's like, you asked for this. <laughs> I'm like, no, I didn't. <laughs> <clears throat> but, you know, just with the different things, um, the different things that you experience, the different things you see and do, um, it, you know, just fighting tiredness is going to be an issue for these guys. Um, and, um, and productivity each day. Because it just, how do I describe like, like working an eight-hour day on the, on the mission field. Because work ethic, to me, is a huge thing. It's really important. You know, I, have, I don't have any room for laziness, all right? So 
when we're there, we want to work as hard as we can. But then I realized at the end of the day, I got nothing done. That's a tough blow, you know, when day after day you, you can't get anything done. And, but you work hard. Part of the reason is in different places like these guys will be, you can't just hop in your car and go to one store that has everything. You know, you've got to, you know, walk 10 minutes this way because you don't have a car and buy toothpaste. And then if you need Q-tips, they're not at the same store. You've got to walk 20 minutes that way. You know, and so you spend three hours walking around buying stuff, and all you've done is like a five-minute run to the gas station. You know, so you know, it all boils down to just be like, man, you know, I'm here to do missions. I'm here to do missions. I'm here to do missions, but I'm not. I'm wasting my time doing all of this. You know, you've got, you've got the, the just the time frame with just daily necessities taking taking a lot of, a lot of time out of your day. And I told Kara, I'm like. In the States, if I was working a 40-hour job, I would be like, I got loads of free time, you know? But here, I couldn't even work a 40-hour job because I wouldn't be able to survive, you know? And what's going wrong? What are we doing wrong? And I've asked older missionaries this. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? You know, and they're like, that's just how it is. Get used to it. And one of my friends told me that he was in Africa, and a man told him, he's like, I figured out the, your problem. And he's like, what? He's like, you try to get more than one thing done in a day. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you, you've, got, you've got the things of just, just consuming your time. You know, and this, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, you know, don't, look at, don't look at me. Your family here, you guys have six families that you just mentioned who are your families. This is their life, okay? You've got this time element just sapping all their time, and then you've got... The, the efforts that you do make and try to do missions, it's not all fun and games there. There's hard hearts out there, man. I mean, these people aren't on the mission field just dying to have you tell them about Jesus. Although spiritually, they are. But physically, you know, I'll just laugh at you most of the time, you know. So you've got that, and you've got all these kind of things. And then um, eventually, your, your, your family, your missionaries, your friends will ask themselves, what is all this doing? You know, and you, as you are also missionaries here, and as you are missionary supporters, you can look at your the lives of your missionaries, and you can look at the fruit because it's all about it's all about putting something in and getting results for us. You know, that's that's really what it all boils down to, and that's what we want to have happen. So it's so easy to stand behind your missionary families from your church when 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 they can stand up here and say, guys. God did something that just blew me away, and because of your prayers, you know, these people and all this kind of stuff, you know, that's the days when it's easy because you're seeing that fruit, all right? So this is what we're talking about right here today, the fruit from missions and how that happens. It's not easy. It doesn't just happen. It's not, you know, one, one incident in China also helps sum up kind of the whole struggle of missions. And here, right here I want to say that missions is a life, a lifelong thing. It's no, it, there's no such thing as gumball machine missions. What do I mean by that? You walk up to a foreign country, stick a coin in, turn the handle, and bloop, out comes a local church. There's no such thing as gumball machine missions. And if anybody tells you that that's what happened, it's highly suspect, all right? So it's a life. It's a long process. Because every person on the mission field that you will try to reach through your dollars and that they will try to reach through their lives, every person is a life, right? They're a life. And each life is a long journey. Think about your life and your journey from where you were when Christ found you or before that to where you are today. Did that happen like a gumball machine? No, it didn't. It happens over years, and every individual on the mission field that we'll try to reach is exactly that, an individual life with years where they might not respond to the Lord's call, or they do, and then when they do, they've got all that spiritual growth to take place, and all of that has to come together to then see a local church planted. So it reminds me of the day that I was out in our neighborhood, and um, some local uh, folks um, that lived in a, in a building, a couple buildings over, I saw them struggling with a heavy load. And they asked for help, and they waited for me, and I came over there to help them. And they had, of all things, in a desert town, an aquarium. 
and not an aquarium. They had one of those like eight foot long, several feet wide, several feet tall, glass this thick, two or three hundred pound aquariums. Okay? So the building is seven floors tall, and he lives on the top floor. And there's no elevator. There's just a narrow staircase that bends and bends and bends and goes up and up and up. So he's like, can you help me? And I'm like, sure. So me and three other guys, we get on this aquarium, right? And we're just lugging it and just, oh, you know, we get it inside the door, and then it just runs into the back of the wall. And we're like trying to turn it to get it around the stairwell and go up, and it's all squishing us, and we're like going under it and over it, you know. And it's hundreds of pounds of delicate glass. And he wants to get it up into his apartment. He wanted turtles or something. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <clears throat> so we're getting it up into his apartment. So we struggle and strain around one bend. And then around the second bend, and that's one floor. And we do that for floor after floor after floor. And we get up to the seventh floor and drop it. <laughs> Glass goes everywhere. And, um, um, and I thought to myself, <clears throat> Well, what was this all about? <laughs> now, in our defense, it wasn't completely ruined. There, it, you know, he said that he might be able to patch it and fix it up or something like that. And so we took it on into his place, you know. Um, yeah, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, I stand there like, man, this feels like my life right now. You know, he's like working and hard. And then, you know, nothing seems to come of it. The problem is, is that we're looking with our short-range vision. Our short-range vision right here. That's the problem. You know, um, the fruit of all of this in missions, in our missions lives, and I, when I say this, our missions lives, I'm saying we're together in this. With the Moreland family, you're together with them in this. And they need to know that, and I think they do. And you need to know that they're together with you in it as well. With Brother Xavier and his family, same story. With all the other families, we're together in this. But... With all of this missions effort together, the fruit of it can be really hard to trace. It can be really hard to trace. And, you, and sometimes you can you know, see missions conference roll around. You can hear missionaries come, and you can be like, yeah, 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 yeah. But really, you know, what is all this doing? That's the title of the message tonight. What is, what is all this doing? So we talked about each individual that we'll try to reach on the mission field, them, them having a life and a lifelong process where God is seeking them, and we're trying to get them to seek him, all right? So this happens over years and years. We have to understand that people are not a crop, all right? Now, in this farming country of Ohio and Indiana, where both of us, where all of us are from, we understand crops. You go out, you till the soil, you put the seeds in, the crop grows or doesn't grow, and then winter comes, and you're done. Now, the Bible likens missions to, to farming a lot, but when you talk about people's lives individually, um, in relationship to the time frame, they're, they're, not, they're, they're not a crop. It's not just like, you know, you water it, and then if, it, you know, if nothing comes up, you know, hey, it didn't grow, you know, let's till that you know, field back up or, or do something different. It's long. It's long. And I just, I just want to illustrate again by if we would each in, reflect inwardly about the journey that it took us and the process that God took us through before he brought us to where we are today, before he brought us to the point that we are of knowing him, of being grounded in his word, of being strong disciples of Christ, able to send out families to other places. But we expect it to happen real quickly sometimes for others. You know, hey, they're people too. They're people just like us. So, you know, Mark chapter 4 and uh, verse 26 really has something to say about this. Mark chapter 4 and verse 26. Mark chapter 4, verse 26. Because this is where we begin to see, you know, we, at, at some point we begin to see some fruit come from missions efforts. It can be little bit by little bit, but here's how it happens. Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 27. Jesus is giving a parable here, and he says, And he said, So is the kingdom of God. As if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep, and rise night and day, and, should, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. Okay? Well, what does it say? Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like this. If you take your seed and put it in your field, and you rise night and day, 
And then you up one day, and those plants are springing up. And you don't know how, but they are. This is what I feel like the results in missions happens like this. Because if you were to ask me, Gawar and the young men that you just saw, they're like, you know, we see the seeds of faith starting to sprout in their heart. Regardless of whether they've accepted Christ or not, those seeds of faith are sprouting in their hearts. And you can say, how is that happening? What did you do? You know what I'm He knoweth not how. Because most of the time, I was messing around with daily life on the mission field trying to get toothpaste and toilet paper. <laughs> Brother, I'm being real honest about this right now. Most of the time, I was dealing with visas and the police. Most of the time, I was just studying language. But God gave us those moments to plant seeds, and we took them. But it doesn't seem like it's enough. It doesn't seem like any seed that we sowed was enough. This is, this is what challenges us in our lives of, of efforts along lines with missions. And why are we talking about this today? Because this is, we love missions. And why? We talked about that this morning. And how? This relates to how. And how can we keep loving missions when we see nothing happen, if that be the case, over a few years? All right? So all the seeds that we've planted and the seeds that we've stuck into the ground and the work that we've done seems so insignificant. It seems like we've done nothing. And then we turn around and we see God at work and seeds starting to sprout here and there. You know, a little faith here, a little seeking, a little question there, a man over here. One person here who does get saved. These seeds are springing up, and you're like, okay, so this is the kingdom of God. Because I put the seeds in the ground, and it sprouts. I don't know how. That's what it's about. God is doing it. God is doing it. God is at work. There are hearts where God is at work. There are places where God is at work. And we've got to let God do the work. Now, be faithful. Have a good work ethic and all this kind of stuff, but let God do the work. But how can we remain together and focused through this process of a long, hard wait for fruit? All right? Now, when your families that you know arrive on the mission field or whether they're there already or whatever, you know, you know that there's long seasons to where you just might be able to scratch your head and be like, what is the fruit of all this? Again, the fruit does not come easy or quickly on most of these mission fields. Now, the, the type of mission field that we've been describing is where most of the unreached people of the world still live, in areas that access to them is not so easy. Because places where you can just move there and have easy access to the people, you know, people have been going there for a while, you know, and in most of those places, I'm not saying they don't need more missionaries, but in most of those places, there's works that are going along, you know, and several generations of people have heard about Christ. But in most of the places where they haven't heard about Christ, in most of the places where they need missionaries the worst, in places that Brother Ron goes, in the places that Brother Xavier is planning to go in Siberia, this is the type of place that we're describing right here. The reason that there's nobody there, really, the reason that there's not much witness there is because of, of the difficulties that we've put out there. You know, the government's the opposition, the spiritual opposition, all of these things. There's some verses in the, in the second half of the chapter, of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where we began, that will really help us to take this into perspective, to absorb it, and to endure. To endure and to keep loving missions, regardless of what happens. You know, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a child. I'm learning a lot about children having a son, uh, and that puts me to the test. And there's just day after day after day that I see no results in him with what I'm trying to teach him, with to do right and be good, you know? My mom would always tell that, you know, uh, that right there to me. She's like, why don't you just be good and do right? <laughs> Two simple little things, you know? But it's impossible for children. So day after day after day after day, and I see uh, there's nothing happening. But I still love him with all my heart, you know? How can we take missions that way? How can we, you take your families that way and in the missions dollars that you're putting in and take it this way and say, you know, day is going by and days are going by, weeks, months, and years are going by, but I still love what God is allowing us to do in missions. And I want to do it till he comes back. It's in this verse right here, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So this is where we started, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 
verse 16, 17, and 18. If you'll just read this with me, and then we'll, that'll, this will be our closing verses. I promised a very short message tonight, and I'm going to deliver. Amen? Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Folks, this, is, this says it right here. This last verse especially. Verse 16 says, for this cause we faint not. You know, even though our inward man perish, we know... Kara and I know that our supporters, that you guys, many of you, are giving for our lives sacrificially. And you might think, ah, you know, do these missionaries even realize that we're sacrificing, that we're dying so that they can have life on their mission field? We do know. And Brother Ron does know. And all of these missionaries, we know. Paul says, for which cause we faint not, you know, even though our inward man perish. And then he says, verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen, again, the things that are seen, folks, they're temporal. The things that you can see with these eyes. This is one of the greatest struggles of life in regards to our faith is things separating out the things that we can see with our eyes and the things that we have to see with our eternal eyes. The things that we have to believe are there, which are the far more important things. Can you see faith in somebody's life? No, but you can, you can see results from it. But you, we believe that God is working in, in China. I believe that God is at work, and I can see fruits starting to come from it. Where your pastor is in India, again, I just am so impressed that he's there doing what he's doing. But what's going to happen is he's going to go there. This is the second time at least, right? Is this just two times that he's been there this? He's going to go there, and maybe he'll go there again, and who knows? And he'll preach to these pastors, and he'll teach them, and they will be thankful, and then he'll come back. He will never see what becomes of all that, and neither will you. But you're not looking at the things that you can see. We are looking at the things we cannot see. And the world doesn't understand that because it makes no sense. How can you look at something you can't see? That makes no sense. Only through Christ. Only through the Spirit. Only through eyes of eternity can we look at things that are not seen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's our faith. It all ties into faith, the very core of who we are in Christ. Amen? Now, we have to allow this process to happen in missions and be okay with it. That was so hard for me to come to that point. And I know that I'll face that challenge again many times in our life on the field. But the point of carrying an aquarium up the stairs, knowing that we're just going to break it. But hey, we're investing in people's lives. You know what I'm saying? The point of spending years and years knowing that, you know, this process we're not going to see these crops spring up overnight and bear fruit. And we're not going to get to eat this ear of corn that I've just planted. I'm talking about gardening terms now, right? We're not going to have this, you know, huge bumper crop of this and that or whatever. But we're going to work in the field and we're going to believe that at the end of this process, it will happen. We have to let that process happen to us and be okay with it. Moreland family, Brother Xavier, your family, all these missions families, we have to let that process of seemingly wasted years happen to us as we serve Christ and be okay with it and just be faithful. All the money that we're putting into missions that might seem at times wasted if you were really honest with yourself, right? We have to let that process happen to us and be okay with it, seeing the things in the end that are not seen. Seeing the things that we cannot see with our eyes, but that we see through faith. In one word, intangible, right? The word intangible means you can't touch it, feel it, and that's exactly what God says when he says, lay up for yourselves treasure, not on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves 
treasure in heaven, where moth and rust cannot corrupt. Amen, brother. And where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, you guys, as a church, have so much to be thankful for with your family, so many families, from your hearts, going to the mission field. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Your treasure is with them. Your heart is with them. This is the process that they're going to go through right here. This is missions. A long life of missions right here. Let this process happen. Stand by them. Have their backs. And believe that God is at work. And one by one, we'll see little seeds start to sprout here and there. And we'll hear of little things that give us life again and that encourage us. It will happen. It will happen. We believe. Amen. Brother Reed, I want to turn it back over to you. That's all I have to say for tonight. I hope that it will be an encouragement to you in some way. Amen. Thank you, brother. What an encouragement. I'd like us to stand, if you would. Lisa's on her way to the piano. We're going to take just a, just a minute of invitation. Allow her to play a verse or two. Give you the opportunity right, to pass up an opportunity to do business with the Lord if he uh, laid something on here. Maybe you need to be that next missionary coming from this church. And uh, if you would go ahead and play. The altar is open. One more stanza. Father, we thank you so much for meeting with us tonight. <clears throat> we thank you that you have given us the opportunity as a church to send missionaries out. Lord, I pray that we would uh, continue to seek, search our hearts, Lord, that um, everyone here in this place would be willing to be that next missionary to go out and um, if you have not called us to go out, I pray that we would be the missionary here. We know there's so much work to do here as well. But I thank you on this I Love Mission Sunday that we've been able to just uh, continue to see why you love missions and in turn why we should love missions. Thank you so much for what you've done here in this place today. Lord, we pray that you would be with us as we go our separate ways. Uh, keep us safe, Lord. I pray that we would be ever mindful of you as we continue on this week. In Jesus' precious name, I do pray. Amen. Well, let's sing our song one last time. The joy of the Lord is my strength. All right. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. 
I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. You're dismissed. Let's uh, see those cards gone, all right?